<laughs> well, thanks for everybody for coming out. Looks like we had a good time, then, did we? <laughs> and we're about to uh, hear a presentation from Kyung Song. And Kyung's expertise lies in the intersection of environmental compliance, data systems, and data analytics, and along with his 10 years of experience in the environment, health, and safety business and digital transformation allowed him to offer industrial clients first-hand insights into environmental management information systems, regulatory compliance, environmental and sustainability metrics, risk management, and digital transformation strategy. Young uses data applications such as Azure, Python, and SQL, Microsoft Power Buy and Power Automate to optimize processes, reduce risk, support integration with systems and managing environment, health and safety, and other business activities. He is also well-versed in state and federal regulatory programs covering air quality, stormwater, wastewater, hazardous waste, and worker safety. So with no further ado, let's hear about data-driven decisions. All right. Weird to hear your own bio, bio like read aloud in front of you. Uh, <laughs> all right, so yeah, we'll keep it real casual at the end of the day. Uh, so please feel free to stop me if you have any questions along the way, but we'll go through um, these slides and um, we'll talk about data driven um, decision making through the industrial digital transformation. So uh, fortunately, co-presenter Brian Fitch was not able to make it uh, for the conference, uh, but he is uh, FAR's Digital Transformation and Analytics Center of Excellence uh, lead, and he has 20 years of experience. Uh, in analytics and digital transformation and has a PhD in human factors, human system interaction. A little bit about myself. So yeah, like the bio said, my, my passion is really at the intersection of environmental engineering and digital transformation and data analytics. Um, so I hope to be able to speak at least somewhat into uh, what this topic is about. So really we're gonna cover two main categories. Today, we'll talk about industrial digital transformation as an overview, and we'll talk about some of the key concepts that are related to industrial digital transformation. And then we'll also look at lessons learned from our own digital transformation at Bar Engineering, as well as looking at some of the client project lessons learned along the way. So I'd like to start by defining for you all digital transformation. So it's the process of uh, using digital technologies to modify business processes, organizational culture, um, business models to meet the changing needs of the market. So uh, we're in what's called the fourth industrial uh, in industrial uh, revolution. And uh, so what that means is it's really an industrial revolution that's built around data and analytics and the technology behind data. So when we think about things like uh, digital transformation, we can go big and think like technologies like cloud computing with AWS and Azure. We can think about things like streaming services like Netflix or Hulu. Uh, we can also think about emerging technologies like ChatGPT, which is the fastest growing software in the history of the world. But we can also think at a much smaller scale. So we don't have to just go big. We can think about things in terms of uh, making changes, software implementations within our businesses that can streamline processes. And anything within any level of our organization that can use technology to automate processes or to get us better data and understanding about uh, our underlying systems and processes. So I also want to talk a little bit about digital transformation versus industrial digital transformation. So on the left side, we're really focused more on that business to business application um, and business to consumer application, and it tends to be asset light um, and oriented more towards the service sector and you can look at businesses and uh, business enhancements and software and on the right we have industrial digital transformation which is more business to business oriented uh, and is asset heavy um, and is usually looking at making improvements to products processes and to our assets So what are we trying to do with industrial digital transformation? Well, ultimately we're trying to achieve the goals of the organization, leveraging digital technology in some way. And sometimes uh, I've seen this quite a bit where, uh, where companies will implement a digital technology for the sake of keeping up with the crowd and without that underlying goal or principle in place of what they're trying to achieve. 
And a lot of times this leads to failure. But a lot, of, but with digital transformation, it works best when companies have that goal, that mission that they're looking for, and then they leverage the right digital technologies and the right ways of working with, within their culture uh, to, to drive that change. And so some of the examples um, that we're looking at is we can look at uh, production optimization, and we'll talk about how, how getting that data and visualization can really help us with optimization. We can look at how to get that end-to-end -end visibility of the entire supply chain. And this is getting, um, this, this is starting to become a lot more in focus as, especially when we look at like ESG voluntary disclosing, it's not just at the scope one and two levels, but it, it's really starting to expand to scope three, which is looking at that end-to-end -end, uh, business and um, value chain. And then we can look at asset management and maintenance. We can look at things like applying sensors to uh, some of our assets and equipment where we can detect the vibrations within that equipment, use predictive modeling so that we can detect when we need predict, uh, preventative maintenance prior to that point. So um, some of the technologies that are involved in Industry 4.0 or within this fourth industrial, um, industrial revitalization is that we're really looking at things that are centered around data. So it's either about the creation of data or the manipulation or visualization of data, but in some way we're leveraging uh, data, whether we're storing it, whether we're analyzing it or visualizing it. So we look at things like the Internet of Things, which is really built around sensor technology and incorporating that to the internet so we can have access to it. Uh, cloud and edge computing, AI, big data and analytics, um, drones and robotics, digital twins, which would, is something that we'll talk about in a little bit, AR and VR, as well as uh, cybersecurity. And of course, there's many other technologies uh, that we're looking at that are associated with Industry 4.0. So uh, one of the important things that we want to talk about today is this concept around a digital twin. A digital twin is really recreating a virtual representation of your physical assets within the virtual space so that you can get an understanding of what's happening, what's changing within your environment, within your assets, within the processes in a virtual representation and have that data available for you to make informed decisions about your processes. So uh, when I was in college, I, uh, I took a thermodynamics course and uh, many of you might have taken a thermal course at some point in your life. Um, and one of the things I remember my professor telling us is that he said, HVAC uh, is much more of an art than it is a science. Uh, and so you can plan about the ground building, you can kind of get an understanding of how many BTUs you might need for which space and, and the size of the piping and things like that. But really at the end of the day, the fine tuning is gonna be done through experimentation, through understanding what's going on actually in your building. And so uh, a lot of times what people do now is they start to implement this internet of things these digital twin kind of concepts within their own homes, because we've seen how challenging it can be to model or to predict or understand our HVAC processes, even within a residential property. So smart homes now a lot of times incorporate smart thermostats. So you put that nest or echo bee on that wall and it can detect for you, uh, of course, the room temperature, but it can also start putting in some logic to that as well. You can start to see the trends. You can start to plan for, you know, when you'll be away from home or using sensors to say detect if a person is there to bring it up to a certain temperature or based on a schedule or whatever. One of the things that I ran into is that um, our, our master bedroom has three vents in it so that it always cools way more than the main part of the house and then it always heats way more than the, way, the rest of the house. And so what we did is we, we put one of those remote sensors as part of our Internet of Things uh, room and with that remote sensor, we were able to say, well, at nighttime, let's go to the room temperature in our bedroom rather than the air temperature in the main area. And again, it's getting us closer to this idea of what a digital twin is. It's creating that virtual representation of our physical spaces of what's changing in our environments so that we can get a better understanding of how to leverage our data and make the best decisions. So I'm not guessing, well, if it's 90 degrees outside and it's I want it to be 70 in my bedroom, then I better set my thermostat to six or 73 so that it doesn't get too cold at night. I can just have it detect at the correct location um, and then be able to leverage that technology. So uh, this is a really important part of what can help you in your digital transformation journey. Um, and uh, with digital twins, it's really about enabling you to see the data, to see what's happening in your physical assets so you can make those informed decisions. 
So with that data, you're able to get get that informed information, that 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 wisdom to be able to say, what do I want to do with my process and how can that achieve the goals of my organization? So in creating a digital twin, there's really four components that are, are pretty crucial to that process. The data needs to be timely, meaning that a lot of times it's in real time or it's streaming data. Um, it has to be accurate, which means it has to reflect the changes and behaviors of the system. So it has to have that right resolution of your assets. It has to be accessible. A lot of times that means putting out that data on a cloud or somewhere where people that need to see your access to the data can do so. And then it has to be integrated with your other digital twins. A lot of times we'll leverage technologies like a data lake, like Snowflake, to be able to bring that data all in one place. And once you have this, you can start to be to develop that deeper understanding of what's going on in your processes, what's going on in your assets, and be able to make the best decisions about your processes. So um, one of the, the challenges that, that you might experience as you start looking at data and the data quality and what data availability you have in your facilities is that even if you have analysts and data scientists, you might not be getting the models quite right. You might not be getting what you're expecting in terms of the values. And a lot of times it's, it's challenges due to this part of the planning and digital transformation process. We don't have the right data. We don't have the right availability of data. So a lot of data scientists and analysts end up being data engineers trying to create the pipelines, trying to get to the right data rather than being able to model the data as the majority of your tasks. So even if you have the most sophisticated machine learning model that you can ever build and all that technology built out, if your data isn't there, if your data is not at the right resolution or it's or it's garbage, your, your machine learning model will simply be a reflection of that garbage data, albeit probably a very expensive and sophisticated model of it. And so uh, now that we, we know a little bit more about digital twins, we look at something called a digital thread. And the digital thread really is to build that end-to-end -end process, to build out the supply, the supply and value chain through connecting different digital twins across the value chain. So at any given point, you can say what's going on upstream and how it impacts my downstream processes and vice versa. This can be really helpful again, as we're not just focused on one facility, but we're looking at logistics, we're looking at shipping, we're looking at how all these things are interconnected and the relationships between them. Again, as we think about things like going to scope three emissions, it can be really valuable to get that broader visibility, that broader data of how these things are interconnected with one another. So now that we talk about some of the key concepts around digital transformation, I want to shift gears a little bit and, and talk a little bit more about BARS journey as well as some of our client projects that highlight digital transformation efforts. And there's really three steps that we think are really important. And this is just one example. Bar is certainly not done with their digital transformation journey and, and some kind of perfect state, but it's an iterative process that's really built around these three points. So the first is developing a vision, principles, and a plan. Again, having that firm foundation of what we want to do and where we want to go. The next is building out that transformative culture and making sure we have a culture that's able to adapt with, with the changes that we're making. And then finally, to make sure that our systems, uh, system architecture and data are built in a way that can handle and, and be able to support the things that we're looking in steps one and two. Again, we're looking at not doing digital transformation and implementing things like AI because they're cool or interesting, but that, that fit in with the, the organization's vision, principles and plan, and to build out a specific one around our transformation journey as well. So we'll take a look at BAR's transformation journey. We said that our goal was we'll establish BAR as the technological and data leader within the industry. And to accomplish this, we have to build our own in-house expertise around data and technology. We have to modernize our systems and architecture. We have to improve project execution and showcase BAR's abilities. So now that we have this vision, we can't just start. We have to gain support. We have to gain support internally within our organization. We have to start with leadership and with those that will be involved in that transformation. And um, we, we wanted to gain support first from executive leadership. And we began by showing what the value of digital transformation was 
and, and how it can benefit our organization both internally and the work that we do for our clients. And as we gained that support, we were able to show this is what we can do with our resources. So when trying to uh, gain support, we found that it's really helpful to not start with maybe just a huge grand plan, but to break it up into different discrete and realistic ideas so that it can be both better understood conceptually and it, it'd be a little bit more palatable in terms of maybe the costs and the resources required. And so while maintaining your original vision and mission, mission overarching missions around, around digital transformation, what we did was we broke up our asks into those discrete sections and then be able to show that we can we can make differences with gaining support with winning those initial projects and being able to gain more traction. One of the things that I think is really important is that uh, a lot of times digital transformations fail and they fail quite frequently because uh, organizations take a big bang approach, meaning they, they make an immense amount of changes all at once. And the, the challenges with that is that if any one piece of what you're trying to change falls apart, things can be so interconnected that the entire transformation effort can fail. So again, we found that breaking up the, the process up into parts, into discrete in, in initiatives, so that we can pilot things out, so we can test things out before we make those wide scale changes can really be a benefit for our process. So an example of this with client work. So there's a client that had been growing through acquisitions and now owns multiple facilities. This is extremely common in oil and gas, where you see that these smaller, um, smaller facilities are are eaten up through the the bigger organizations. And within uh, each of those, there are independent approaches to how they were gathering data, how they were storing data, how they were processing and visualizing that data. And so there can be a lot of challenges with that as you're trying to build out a standardized and integrated data system that is able to see, again, overall at the level of your entire organization, how does this look? So what we did is we initially kind of gave them a, a really big scope of what we could do to go through their transformation effort. But again, we ran into concerns around costs and the concerns around just the complexity that was required. So we broke it up into two phases. So phase one looks at integration of systems into a single portal to allow consolidated access to sign up. This gave some immediate relief in terms of people not having to go into five different systems to access their data, to see it all in one location. And it immediately showed the value of the transformative effort. So then we could go on to phase two with a proposal to develop a more long-term strategy. Again, having gained support, having gained traction, and earning some of that trust and make more long-term information management recommendations. One of the big things that often goes uh, unnoticed is that, that that digital transformation is really as much about the, the transformation of the culture as it is about the technology themselves. A lot of times that I've seen personally when digital transformations fail, the biggest bottlenecks have been in the culture itself. And, and, it's, uh, and the culture saying that they didn't want to go through that transformative effort. There's a lot of different reasons that, that this can happen, but we think it's really important to make sure that organizationally, that culture is aligned and receptive in a way that would be able to transform digitally and, and transform and adapt with technologies that are being implemented. So how do you develop a, a culture that is conducive to transformation? Uh, the key word around this is agility. As an organization, you have to be agile. You have to be able to adapt quickly to some of the external pressures that are going around you, but you also have to know when to not transform um, and go through that evaluative process. So there's definitely risks associated with change and transformation. So we really need to be intelligent about how we go through that transformation effort. One of the one of the key approaches that we've taken in minimizing risk is something called um, developing a minimum viable product, which really looks at addressing the biggest issues that can gain the most value, but that would take up the least amount of our time and resources and finding that sweet spot. And, and the thing that's, that can be really valuable about this is that we can fail fast and fail cheap. 
And what we mean by this is that we can quickly identify when there's an issue or something that we, we hadn't seen before that's a concern within that process before we go very uh, resource intensive and invest a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of our people's uh, energy into a certain transformative effort. So we're able to see what the biggest issues are potentially ahead of time by starting with that minimum viable product concept. If you want to innovate and explore ideas, another big part of it is what's going on organizationally. Is there trust and empowerment or is everything coming from top down and being pushed to the masses? So again, this is the important part of having that step one. You have the vision in place. You have that, that concept of where you wanna go and the principles in place. And then do you empower your employees to make changes without having to go through undue administrative hurdles? So are you are you empowering your employees to make the transformations that need to happen to make your organization uh, improve? So when beginning our own transformation journey here at BAR, um, we had to determine how we're going to approach it organizationally. Do we want to go top down or do we want to go bottom up and go more organically? Digital transformation leaders kind of vary on which they think is the best process and it, it probably kind of is um, is related to how your organization is set up in its culture as well. But what we did at first is we started with this approach of this top-down process. So there was a steering, team, uh, steering committee that was developed with uh, a lot of senior leaders, and there was this effort that was made to make all these transformative efforts. And it turned out to have some effect and impact, but it wasn't anything that we would call a significant transformation. And so what we did was kind of look back and say, OK, what was happening there? Why didn't that work very well? Well, it turns out, and you all may know this, that senior leaders do very different kinds of work than the vast majority of your organization. So there can be a huge disconnect in what the senior leaders are seeing versus where a lot of your employees are seeing it. And a lot of times the senior leaders don't have the time and resources to dedicate to the energy intensive, resource intensive and detailed tasks that are associated with transformation. So when re redesigning the center of excellence that we have today at BAR, we really built it around these seven subgroups and these 50 practice groups that, that go into these seven subgroups. Instead of going with senior level management, we looked at the mid-level management because we saw that they were both interconnected with what was going on in the organization in terms of what work we were doing with our projects, but they were also connected up and down the organization and saw the value that transformations can make for both what we did internally, as well as what we could do for our clients. So there's 50 different practice groups within our organizations that are around, developed around certain technologies or certain types of businesses. And any one individual can go in and out of those practice groups um, to help the, the objectives of that practice group. For us, this approach worked really well for our organization. Of course, it's not something that can be applied at any organization, but through iterative efforts, we found that this way, this approach uh, worked best for our organization. And then finally, we'll look at system architecture and data design. You can build out the best culture and the best goal, but if you don't have the system and architecture to be able to support that vision and that culture, you're just not going to get very far. So as we mentioned before, uh, digital transformation is really dependent on having that accessible, timely, accurate, and secure data. And we found that uh, there are unique challenges with our organizations as there is with any organization around building a system architecture. So one of those challenges is that we have over a thousand clients. At any given point, we have thousands of different projects that are happening, and we need to be able to be flexible and scalable in a way that we can grow with demands of our organization. So we're really looking for a system architecture that could grow with us, that could be flexible to what the needs of our organization were. So one of the key lessons learned along the way is that we need a partner when needed. So initially we were trying to make this transform transformation effort all on our own, but we realized we really didn't have the in-house expertise needed to make those changes that we were looking for. So after going to Microsoft and with Azure, um, they were able to give us a grant to partner with an organization that was able to build out, help us build out the, the data architecture systems that we were really looking for and for what we call today our modern data architecture. And this is really the backbone for 
a lot of the projects and work that we do at BAR and gives us that flexibility and scalability, that on-demand computational power that we need for our organization to thrive. And the last two lessons are really centered around uh, another project that we worked on where a client was concerned about the structural stability of their coal silos due to unusual vibrations. So unusual vibrations with coal, coal silos can certainly be a big concern. One of the things that we were looking at first is applying different sensors at that coal silo and then also collecting that, that flow pattern that was going through that silo. So after uh, going through the process and doing the analytics and going through the data science, um, what, what the data science team found was that it was due to certain non-uniform flow patterns within the coal silo, um, and it, it was not something that, that threatened the structural stability of that silo. So there are some key lessons that we learned along the way in this process. The first one is that we really need to be able to build a an actual hypothesis and a science experiment approach towards these kinds of tasks. Meaning we have to figure out what we're testing and what is the resolution that we need in testing that data so that we're not collecting more data than, than is necessary for what we're trying to achieve. So uh, for, for this task, what we saw was 5 billion different records and a lot of excess data that we, we probably didn't need to, to have. And this can eat up a lot of your data storage it can slow down your computational efforts and your analytics efforts as well. So go at the right resolution of the data that you need. Set up that experiment in a way that you understand what, what resolution you need of that data, what you need to do to actually see the changes that you're trying to test. And then again, don't add, don't add additional expenses and incur additional expenses more than necessary. So with that, let me uh, review just what we talked about today. Uh, so we talked about this idea of a digital twin, which is a virtual replication of a process, a system, a site, a facility, or an organization that gives you that, that virtual data that we're looking for so that you can understand the processes, the changes that are associated with it. Next, we look at this concept of a digital thread that connects the digital twins together up and down the value chain so that we can understand the traceability across the entirety of the value chain and start to build an understanding of the relationships up and down the value chain as well. And then finally, we looked at our lessons learned along our own transformation journey and some of the things that we've talked about with our clients. Uh, one, again, starting with that vision, principles, and a plan, and then looking at that transformative culture and finally building out a robust architecture and data design to support what you're looking for. So with that, that's the uh, end of this presentation. And so I'm happy to answer any questions that y'all may have. Yes. When you're when you're talking about transformative culture, um, and I think about digital media, I think of uh, kind of the corruption factor. Uh, how much how much of uh, the experience that that you've seen with Bar has been aligned with? Um, sort of generational changes and, and do you have any tips on how to overcome some of those? Yeah, I think one of the big things is that a lot of times the end users are not incorporated as part of the decisions that are made around transformation. Um, and because of that, there's less buy-in associated with it. There's less stake for them. But I think a lot of times when we face really big challenges with people resisting change, it's because we haven't sold the actual value that it has for them. So if there's no value for them, of course, they're going to continue to, to make changes. A lot of times, people that have been in organizations long enough have seen many iterations of these kinds of digital transformations. And a lot of times, it ends up just being a lot more work for them. And you know, you got to learn this new process, and then it fails in a year, and you're back to whatever you were using before. So I think a big part of it is, is making sure that they're involved in the decision-making process, and they have some stake and ownership in the process. And I found that that really works well a lot. A lot of times, when I see huge failures in, in in these transformation processes. And I've seen like significant failures where millions of dollars were spent on these transformations that fail. Um, it's because management pushed down solutions that really were not helpful or it, it kind of made roadblocks um, for, for those issues. A lot of times what I've seen organizations do when they face that is they create workarounds 
to those solutions that they just spent millions of dollars implementing, and then they just revert back to whatever they were using uh, previously. So that buy-in, that voice of the customer, the voice of the end user in part of the planning process to say, what are the actual pain points and how we address them? I think a big part of that is, are we setting the vision? Are we setting the culture at, at, with the frontline people that are doing the work that's gonna be impacted by the transformation, or is it always gonna be kind of this top-down approach where management says, you shall do this because it's the next thing to do without having that that voice of customer uh, or end user. Yeah, and then a, the, the other big piece of that really is um, show them the, the value, right? Like it, you were doing this, it took you hours to do. When we go to this, it's gonna be a lot better. And it's not just gonna take away time and work from you, right? You're not just gonna be kind of automated out of your job. This frees you up to do now these other things. And I think when we approach it that way and we say, hey, this isn't to take your job away. This is to make it so that we can take away some of that grunt work that you're working on or some of these other tasks, and then to build out processes where we can use more creative capacities or where you're able to kind of search for the things that, that you're, you're uh, looking for. And it really helps to have those ideas in the background of these are the projects you could do once we have that bandwidth um, that's, that's, uh, that we're taking up on these repetitive tasks. Really good question. Any others? Yes. I'm going to piggyback that a little bit. Is there um, any particular vertical that you're finding are more conducive for, for transformation in this sort of uh, digital approach? Are there areas that you feel need this and maybe you don't realize it yet? Like, we're, as far as the space goes in Hot 4 are there particular groupings of of the industry that, that to make the most sense for, for this? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I think every industry can benefit from, from transformation. Um, uh, some of the places that I think there's a lot of benefit is again, like repeat a, like tasks that have to be repeated over and over again, where you can look at a, a process where it's like, can we collect that data automatically instead of incurring a high level of risk around like wrong numbers being put in. And we see this all the time in, in, um, in our environmental compliance task where we have field forms that are being filled out to collect uh, data on a meter or something like that. And then we get the data and we're, we're running a report and we see, you know, instead of 860, 8,670 hours, it's just some insane number that's like more hours than is possible in, in the year. And so it's like those kinds of things, can we build in things in place that maybe instead of relying on that operator field collection data, we can build in all alarms and, and, and SCADA systems or historians in a way that can collect that data automatically and, and, and incorporate into our system. And then we get a lot more visibility of that data as well. We can put into a dashboard. We can have that data streaming into um, a, a, a dashboard system where we can say, OK, these are my tolerances. If I'm getting out of this range, can you tell me? Another huge benefit there. So you're not just automating the data associated with compliance tasks and record keeping, but you're 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 able to catch the issues before they become bigger issues when they start to get out of those tolerance zones. So yeah, I think anything that really involves like uh, repetitive tasks or, or areas of high inaccuracy uh, opportunities um, are huge places where digital transformation, especially, can make a lot of changes. And then I think there's a lot of things where it's just like we're in a new era. We have to keep up with our competitive edge. And I think that's a big push for digital transformation now. Everyone's talking about machine learning, AI, and chat GPT. Um, and I think the big reason why is because we're seeing how disruptive it can be. Uh, can these things summarize our air permits or regulations for us? Can they do these tasks that are, again, very energy intensive that we can free up so that our people can do more creative tasks um, that, that drive a lot of value for our customers? So, yeah, I think we're seeing a lot of potential there with how we model our data, um, how we organize written um, documents and things like that. Um, but, yeah, every industry, I think, has an area, and you've probably seen it too, where there's a lot of opportunities for transformation, but it's really about making sure that it aligns to the, the goals and the mission of the organization as well. I think there's a, a value of being able to help the customer understand how those roles will change. Right. Right. And, and like you said, they'll they'll have more time mm -hmm. to do other tasks. Yeah. Do they know how to do those other tasks? Right. Are yeah. They, are they yeah. prepared for yeah. for maybe more strategic thinking? Yes. And, you know, a little less touch of the machine. Right. It's feeling yeah. a little more data analysis and. You know, not, not that we would necessarily need to do all those right. things for them, but be able to kind of guide them through maybe some suggestions on how to do that. Is that yeah. Right? 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's a big part of like the organizational change management process yeah. is have you addressed those issues before the go live date? Because by then it's too late. It's going to be chaos, you know. Um, but yeah, I think. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Really well. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, a lot of times change management doesn't go well. And it's like, oh, my gosh, no one's trained up properly. User access isn't there. Uh, things like that. And it's like we already lost our old system. That's that's gone. Um, but yeah, I, I think uh, uh, one of the things that we did with uh, one of our clients that was uh, really concerned about, you know, that this kind of take away jobs from people um, is that is that we we made sure like these are the projects that you will be working on as you kind of transition out of what you were doing. Course. And are we at time now, Sean? Uh, we're pretty much out of time, but you can you can keep oh, going. All right. the last one up. Oh no, thank you so much, everyone. Appreciate all the time.